Well, good morning, Emmanuel, and a very warm welcome to anyone else who might be joining us this morning for our Sunday service. It is great to welcome you this morning. Uh, I'm here in the Emmanuel Church building in Broad Street, uh, imagining you at home in your living room or your kitchen or in your bedroom, maybe in your pajamas or in your Sunday best. I, I don't know. Uh, maybe you're on your own this morning. Maybe you're with others in a household. Uh, I don't know, but I do know that though we're apart, the Spirit of God unites us as a church family. And wherever you are this morning, uh, please know for sure that God is there with you. He's present by his Spirit. Uh, you can be absolutely sure of that. Psalm 105 begins, uh, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, praise him, tell of all his wonderful acts. Uh, our first song this morning picks up the theme of, of God's name being made known among the nations as people come to know Jesus, as his kingdom comes. So whether you want to stand or, or stay seated, uh, whether you want to uh, sing out loud or sing in your heart, uh, our first song, uh, Let Your Kingdom Come. Let's 
pray together. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. God, our Father, this morning we come to you with humble and thankful hearts. And we pray, Lord, that you would come and meet with us in our different places, uh, with whatever we're carrying in our hearts today. We pray, Lord, that you would draw us into your presence, that we would experience your grace, that we would come closer to know more of Jesus, the bread of life, that you would satisfy our souls as we trust in him. God, we offer you our time and our service this morning and pray that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder who you are following. Uh, is Follow the Leader still a, a game that you children play? I, I remember playing it as a child, following along in a line, uh, doing what the person at the front does. Do you still do that? I, I, obviously, you'd have to have a two-metre gap between children in the line if you were to play it now. Uh, but I remember it was, it was fun. We followed the leader because we all follow others. Mimics life and our world. Sometimes we do it on purpose. Uh, other times it just happens. We're influenced by our parents or by our friends and peers or by our government or by the advertisers, whoever wants to, to lead, we often follow. Now, here are some famous leaders on the screen who have influence, not all in the real world, I have to say. I wonder if you can recognise them and do you know who they lead? Well, here, here's the first one. Uh, who is this? You recognise him? Yes, you're right. It is Peter Rabbit. Uh, he's a bit of a leader of his friends and his family members. Uh, often he gets them into trouble. You'll know that if you know the stories. Um, do you remember who he leads? Uh, have you shouted them out? Uh, they are Benjamin Bunny, Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail. And I gather there's a new friend, Lily Bobtail, who's a member of the, the gang. Uh, okay, here's the, here's the next one. Some of you will recognise him. Uh, do you see uh, who's that? Any, any names? Yes, you got it? Tell the person next to you if you know. It's Optimus Prime, very good. He leads the Transformers, the Autobots as they're known. Like, uh, and do you remember the other names of any of them? Yeah, Bumblebee, Ratchet, Ironhide, Jazz, apparently, uh, against the Decepticons. That's who he leads them against. Okay, here's, a, here's another one. Here's a real life person. Let me know and remember her name. If you said Greta Thunberg, you'd be correct. Well done. Uh, she doesn't have a position of leadership officially, but she has led the campaign for action on climate change in these last uh, two or three years. Uh, and many, especially young people, have been greatly influenced by her. Okay, here's another one. Uh, slightly different this time. Not in the real world. Uh, who is this? Tell the person next to you, tell your dad, your mum, yes, is it the fat controller? Of course it is. Uh, you'll remember him. Uh, and who does he lead? Well, of course, Thomas the Tank Engine. And do you remember the other engine? Some of you will know them off by heart. Yes, there's Edward, Henry, Gordon, James, Percy. I expect you know some of the others as well. Uh, okay, last one. Here's uh, a real life person this time. Yes, of course it is. Boris Johnson, uh, Prime Minister. Who does he lead? He leads the Conservative Party, he leads the, the, the government, the, the nation. Uh, in the real world, you see, God gives us uh, leaders, and the Bible says we're to pray for them, to respect them, to seek to follow their lead, unless, of course, they, they want to do things that God says we shouldn't do. Sometimes that happens, and, and Jesus has said some really tough things about some of the religious leaders of his day. He, he said this, he said, woe to you blind guides. And he warned his disciples, if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But we have to choose our leaders carefully, we have to be alert. And many want to influence us for their own ends. Uh, Jesus was different to the religious leaders of his day. Not, not just coming to, to wield authority, to make people do things, to bring them under his uh, uh, power. But Jesus was a leader who came to serve, 
to lay down his life for those who would follow him. That's why the cross is so central to our faith. You might like to memorize this this wonderful verse. It's uh, Mark 10, verse 45. There it is on the screen. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's leadership. That's the kind of leader we'd want to follow. Jesus gave his life for us. But uh, he was raised to new life. And he's now seated in heaven. It was an Ascension Day on Thursday, if you've heard of that day. It's a day when we celebrate Jesus' return to heaven. And now he is a risen king, full of love for those he died for. And he's the only one worth following. Even our best leaders are fallible, but Jesus is the perfect leader. He'll always lead us in right paths. He'll calm our fears. He'll protect us as we follow him. He'll provide all we need and will satisfy our souls. He'll make our lives fruitful and useful in the world as we stay close to him. Jesus is the king and he's the one to follow above all others. We've got to sing that song now that that picks up that theme. Uh, For you children, if you're feeling energetic and need to get moving, uh, well, I think there's going to be some actions for you to join in with. Uh, I'm following the king. for the notices now. Last Sunday evening we had uh, a break from our series in the book of Revelation. That's going to carry on this evening. Uh, We had a live service instead on Zoom uh, with the opportunity to hear from various members of the church family. Uh, What a great encouragement it was. Uh, If you weren't able to join us for that, that service is now on our YouTube channel. Uh, Do have a look. Be encouraged by uh, members of your family sharing uh, from their experiences of lockdown. Uh, Christianity Explored is now underway, a little group exploring life together. Uh, It's not too late to join. Do contact Andrew Patterson if you'd like to. His email address and phone number uh, is on the notice sheet and on the website too. Uh, Here's a late entry for the Messy Church Trifle of the Month. Uh, What a beautiful looking trifle that is, isn't it? Thank you, Annie and Susie, for sending uh, the picture in. It looks delicious. Uh, Good to be reminded again uh, of the being wise builders who build our lives on the solid teaching of Jesus so that we can stand firm in the storm. Quick mention uh, this morning about our finances as a church. We've not mentioned them since lockdown. And uh, we're thankful to God for his ongoing provision, uh, for the generosity of, of giving at Emmanuel. Of course, we are facing significant challenges for our economy And that's going to affect personal circumstances for some. Uh, It may be that some will need to reduce their giving during this time. Uh, Others will be unaffected. Some may be able to increase our giving to help uh, others for the work of the gospel through Emmanuel. 
how we use our money, of course, is part of our worship. It's one area of our discipleship that God wants us to keep thinking and praying about. If you'd like any information, please do speak to our treasurer, Ian. His details are on the website. Um, I thought we'd just pause for a moment this morning to uh, pray, give thanks, and for prayer into this area. I'm going to just read those words from David. Uh, David's words from 1 Chronicles 29. He gathered gifts for building the temple. And then he uh, prayed these, this prayer. He said, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. And he said, I'm just, Lord, giving back to you what is yours already. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your generous provision to us as a church. We thank you, Lord, for the many resources you've given to us, time and talents and, and treasure too. We pray, Lord, that you would give us great wisdom in knowing how you used to use it wisely and generously for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of others and help each one of us in our own personal discipleship to be joyful, cheerful and sacrificial givers for the sake of the gospel. Lord, we acknowledge our dependence upon you and we pray that you would continue to bless us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's important, as uh, we say every week, to stay connected uh, when we're apart. Uh, the, the guys had a good time yesterday over a virtual breakfast. Uh, and as always, here are some of the Emmanuel Church family sending their greetings to all who are watching. Hi, you lovely people at Emmanuel. We're missing you all. One thing I'm not missing now is putting chairs out for everybody. Take care, everybody, and uh, keep well, keep safe, and look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you. Bye. Bye. Hello, everybody. Everybody enjoying their lockdown? I'm all right. I'm enjoying it, the silence, and listening to hear the birds singing for a change. I'm doing a bit of gardening. I'm sitting around and reading. So I'm, I'm quite all right, and people are looking after me. It'd be nice to see everybody in due course. I don't know when. Hello, Emmanuel. Miss you all. I still love you all. God bless. Ron. Hello, Mr. Emmanuel. I hope you're all well. Enjoying the lovely weather we've got. I've been sitting in the sun. It's been glorious. But I can't wait to get back to the morning services at Emmanuel and to the lunching company dinner. Bye. Hi, Emmanuel. Hope you're all well and enjoying the beautiful weather. I've been furloughed, so I've had more time to sit and enjoy the garden and to be able to go walking and cycling in this area of outstanding natural beauty that we live in. Hopefully we'll be able to meet again in person before too long. But in the meantime, it's been wonderful to be able to enjoy the services online and to be able to connect with home group and ladies Bible study group via Zoom. Have a good week, everyone. Church. Happy Sunday to all the people who are listening now. Yes, stay safe in the house. We all making, we are all doing our prayers for everyone in the whole world. That they'll get better from the corona, coronavirus pandemic. This is how we spend our day watching telly and reading books, do school work. And I like to play my den when I get some time to. So I would like to show you in my den. Over to you, Mum. Hello, uh, this is my den. I've got quite a lot of things. Come closer, Mum. I've got quite a lot of things in here. I've got some teddies. I've got some Play-Doh. An old strainer. And an old pan so that's what I do in my den sometimes I like to like do some crafts and listen to some music on the radio player okay that's all for me bye
Well, how lovely to see those familiar faces and hear the voices. Please feel free to send me something similar. Don't wait to be asked. If you want to see your church family in real time, uh, then do join the Sunday social at the end of the service. Uh, there was lots of frustrations last week. I know with Zoom having problems across the country, uh, hopefully it'll work better uh, today. Just, just click on the link in the email. You'll be welcomed by a, a host and feel free to stay as long or as short as you like. As a church family, uh, we need to stay connected with each other. Uh, but of course, we also want to look outwards to others. Uh, we've been doing that in all sorts of practical ways with support for food bank and storehouse and other community initiatives. Uh, but next Sunday, we're doing something different, something uh, that we haven't done before. Uh, our service uh, is going to have a, a focus on those beyond our church family. It's going to be a kind of online guest service. The title uh, will be, Is Peace Possible in Turbulent Times? I hope that might be in a kind of an attractive theme for those who might be anxious, for those who, who are thinking about things, whose lives are being shaken by the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, the service is going to be uh, quite a lot shorter than normal. Uh, it's going to include an interview, uh, fewer songs. Uh, it'll include a talk from the Bible, which uh, is particularly, it has not yet Christians in mind. We'll all need to hear it, of course. Uh, but, but the idea is that we're going to reach out. We want to use this for reaching out. And, and I hope that, that, that we can invite family and friends to watch the service. The wonderful thing is we don't have to invite them to come all the way to Chesham to, 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 to join in. Uh, we can invite them just to join in online from wherever they are. Uh, some will be local, but others will be further away. Uh, we're going to put uh, an invitation uh, through lots of doors this week. Uh, but it really depends on everyone, all of us sharing the links on Facebook and YouTube with, with all our networks, uh, if we're going to reach out to others effectively and use this opportunity of being online. So uh, that's the question, is peace possible in turbulent times? Now, please be praying this week, be active this week in, in your desire to, to, to make Jesus known in Chesham and the world. Children would normally be going out now. Uh, I hope that you had a brilliant session this morning. Uh, Eagles, Pathfinders last Wednesday, type on Tuesday. Uh, you ravens and sparrows, you're also very precious to us. And the crash babies, of course, including little Patrick, the newest addition. So let me pray for you before you head off to Right Now Media or other activities, if you haven't already gone. Uh, let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you for our young people. We thank you how precious they are to us as a church family, even more to you as their heavenly Father. That we pray, Lord, that you would draw near to them, encourage their hearts, help them as they miss friends from school, uh, be close to them, help their parents. Uh, Lord, be in the work in the midst of our families and have your special blessing on our children, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to have a moment now uh, for confession. You'll remember, I think, the answer that Jesus gave when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. On, all of, on, on these hang all the law and the prophets. That two commands, really, loving God, loving our neighbour. And Jesus held that up as a mirror to our lives. And as we look in that mirror, we see for sure that we neither love God with all we are and we often fail to love our neighbours ourselves. So it's right to confess our sins, to come before God in humility and sorrow. And so we'll just have a moment of quiet so you can confess personally, individually to God and then we'll say together, the prayer which will be on the screen. Well, if you'd like to join with me, we pray. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are. 
and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. The Bible says this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his only son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Our forgiveness and our life depends on God's great love shown in the cross of Jesus. We're going to sing of that now before Sarah comes to lead us in a time of prayer. How deep the Father's love for us. God the Father. You call us your children and you love us and you love to hear us when we pray. Thank you that at this time of pandemic we don't need to fear pouring out our souls and our deepest fears to you. For those who come to me I will never drive away. Pray that we would cast all our anxieties on you but also that we would frequently read your word, to become like a tree planted by streams of water, whose leaf does not wither, whatever this world throws at it. 
Thank you that you are interested in each and every one of us. We are all experiencing this pandemic in different ways and we ask that you would use this time of hardship, Lord, to teach us more about you and enable us to grow a deep and unshakable personal faith. Amen. Father, we pray for our world. We pray for world leaders and the difficult decisions each one is facing. We ask that even if they don't believe in you or follow you, that you will give them wisdom to make the right decisions concerning this pandemic for the good of us all. We pray that politicians will put aside self-interest when deciding how to rebuild societies ravaged by the virus. We pray for our own country, for Boris Johnson and his cabinet, for Keir Starmer, the leader of the opposition, for Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland, and for the First Ministers of Wales and Northern Ireland. We pray that they would be united in one purpose and seek the common good. We pray particularly for the decision over reopening schools. We pray that appropriate measures would be agreed upon so that children of all backgrounds can benefit from a proper education. We also pray for the scientists working on a vaccine. We pray particularly for Professor Andrew Pollard and the Jenner Institute in Oxford, that their work on immunisation will prove successful. Let's just take a moment of quiet while we bring to God any areas of concern we may have regarding the leadership of our country and the decisions it makes. Amen. We pray for the work of our mission partner, Serving in Mission, an organisation whose focus is sharing the gospel worldwide. We pray that their ministries can continue despite the pandemic. We pray that they will adapt and find new ways of doing things to reach the many communities around the world who still need to hear about Jesus. We pray that their workers would be creative, courageous and confident as they seek to share the gospel. We pray that serving in mission can support their work as well during the pandemic, that their single workers especially would be cared for by fellow team members, even in the midst of isolation. We pray for the leadership to have great wisdom about the way forward as the world starts to unlock. We pray especially for wisdom over health and travel advice and that they would rely on God's strength and wisdom rather than their own. Amen. And now, Father, we pray for our own church and our own time. Thank you that we have been able to continue to meet using the available technology. Thank you that people who don't usually attend church have been following Sunday services and pray that each one will come to know you. Thank you for the initiatives in Chesham to support vulnerable families and people. We pray for the ongoing work of Food Bank, the Community Fridge, the new Food for Life project run by Restore Hope Latimer, and other community initiatives, like the Big Friday Night Community Takeaway. We pray that you would be glorified in all that we do, and that vulnerable and needy families would be reached. Amen. And we pray for one another and those we know who are suffering particular hardships at this difficult time. Let's take a moment of quiet while we bring to God those we know for whom life is hard. Amen. Finally, Simon Peter answered Jesus, To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. So let's close by saying together the Lord's Prayer, 
the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Today's reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 25 to 71. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, you were looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it, is, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and you still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will but to do the will of him who sent me. 
And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those that he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. At this the Jews there began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the father and learned from him comes comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is the real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate the manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. And yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're back in John's Gospel this morning, and last week we were confronted with two great signs, two amazing uh, miracles of Jesus, uh, the feeding of that huge crowd, 5,000 men plus women and children, uh, and Jesus walking uh, on the water. And we saw, didn't we, I hope, that these astonishing acts of power are not simply uh, Jesus entertaining us with magic tricks, but through these amazing and powerful acts uh, revealing himself. Uh, pointing us uh, to truths and realities that we urgently need to grasp if we are to experience what John calls life uh, in all its fullness. And this morning we're going to be exploring more deeply that that first uh, feeding miracle uh, as Jesus now teaches and explains uh, its rich uh, significance uh, for us. Well, one Christian thinker once described the Bible as follows. He said, the scriptures are are shallow enough for a young child to come and drink from without fear of drowning and deep enough for theologians to to swim in without ever uh, touching the bottom. And I think he's right. And perhaps nowhere is that insight more clearly displayed than in these verses as we 
uh, look at them this morning as we are confronted with truths that are, I think a small child uh, can grasp, but also challenged by big and hard truths that certainly we won't get to the bottom of in, in 20 or so minutes. Well, whether we see ourselves as babies or heavyweights, spiritually speaking, we do need God's help to understand his word. So let's pray before we dive in. Let's pray. Father, we praise you that you are a God that can be known by the simple and the wise, the young and the old, whatever our background, whatever our story. Please give us listening ears and humble hearts so that we might know Jesus more and no life as we feed on him uh, for Jesus sake. Amen. Well on one level what Jesus wants us to know from our passage this morning is incredibly simple and clear. Three times uh, in these verses Jesus says I am the bread of life and it's the first of, of John's official I am saying statements uh, Jesus makes about himself uh, that reveal big and important truths about who he is and why he's come into the world. And Jesus claims to be uh, the bread of life. Uh, well, bread, it's not complicated, is it? I mean, I don't need to explain how bread works to you. Uh, and just to make the point, I uh, bought a, a loaf of bread uh, from Sainsbury's and no, uh, no instructions uh, came with it, uh, no use, user manual supplied. Indeed, I noticed that when my kids were barely old enough to, to sit up, uh, they got the bread thing pretty quickly. You, you, I gave them a breadstick, and after they'd finished trying to sort of poke their eye out uh, with it, uh, they, they stuck it in their mouths uh, and they ate it. It's not rocket science. Uh, when I'm hungry, uh, bread uh, feeds me. It satisfies, satisfies that hunger and sustains me. So you're with me so far? Keeping up? Not going too fast? Well, well now Jesus is taking a very simple thing and saying, uh, Listen up, I'm the bread of life. And at one level, what Jesus wants us to grasp this morning, it's very simple, it's not complicated, that we will get to some big mind-stretching truths before we're through. And just to make it even clearer still, remember Jesus has just performed that amazing miracle, taking a kid's packed lunch and miraculously feeding over 5,000 plus people with five small bread rolls and two fish. And when he's done, people are full and 12 baskets of leftovers are collected up. Well, not surprising, the crowds, including many of those uh, who are part of that free, uh, feeding frenzy, uh, want to hang out some more with, with Jesus. But did you notice Jesus is not impressed, is he, by their enthusiasm? Uh, verse 26. Uh, the reason you're looking for me, says Jesus, um, is ultimately because I filled your bellies with food. Uh, but don't you see, uh, that was just a sign, and the bread I gave uh, you points to something far bigger and more wonderful that I want to give you. You're thinking just about the physical, the short term, but I have much more to offer you, uh, something that you uh, desperately need. Well, just as I don't need to explain bread, I don't need to explain hunger, do I? In fact, I, I wager that within an hour or so, uh, the reality of hunger will, be, uh, will come something that you will find hard to ignore. Uh, especially if you're watching the stream and already the aroma of Sunday lunch is starting uh, to fill the air. But of course, hunger goes, doesn't it, beyond the physical. And I guess we know what it means to, to be hungry at a, at a deeper level. Indeed, most of us have discovered that at some point it's possible to have uh, most, even all of our physical needs met in some way, water, food, shelter, etc., and still not be satisfied. Indeed, to have this ache sort of deep in us, which you might even call a hunger, a hunger for something more. Well, here's someone we've all heard of expressing that deeper hunger. He says, uh, there remains uh, deep in the soul, if I dare use that word, a persistent and unconscious anxiety that, that something's missing, uh, some ingredient uh, that makes life uh, worth living. Well, those are very honest words of, of heir to the throne, Prince Charles. Uh, someone I imagine who has much more than most people in the world, and yet he admits, doesn't he, to that deeper uh, nagging uh, hunger. Well, helpfully, the Bible explains that hunger for us. You see, it tells us that we were created for, for something, or should I say someone. 
Indeed, from the very beginning, it tells us that we were not only uh, made by God, but also for God. And so that deeper hunger we experience is actually a, a hunger for him. And, and now uh, Jesus appears and declares, I am the bread of life. I am the bread come down from heaven, from the Father. And so do you see uh, just the enormity of this claim? Again, look down at verse 35. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. They are, aren't they, the most astonishing words. Jesus is saying, if you want a lasting satisfaction that your heart is crying out for, if you want that God-shaped hole in you filled, then you must come to me. Indeed, he tells his crowd, just as the physical bread I, I've given you satisfied your physical hunger, at least for a while, the miracle actually is a sign that points you to the fact that I am the one who can satisfy that spiritual hunger you have completely and indeed forever. Or put slightly differently, Jesus is saying, without him, without coming to him, uh, feeding on him, uh, we can never find true and lasting satisfaction for that deepest of hungers. Uh, sure, you can try and ignore that hunger, you can look at other things to try and fill it, but unless we go to him with our hunger, uh, we will always be hungry, because he is the bread of life. Well, before we're done, we'll, we'll unpack what it means to, to come to him and to feed on him, but this is the big message of John 6, uh, your deep hunger, uh, that, that, that ache that cries out to be satisfied is met and only met by this one man, uh, Jesus. And before we move on to some deeper, more difficult truths, uh, just two wonderful things that Jesus wants us to discover about this truth and this uh, offer he's making. First, this offer uh, to feed us, uh, to fill us and to satisfy us is a, a free offer. It's something received as a gift. Uh, did you spot that in verse uh, 29? Well, the crowds are clearly intrigued by Jesus, certainly amazed at the miracle of the feeding. And as he speaks of the offer of food and, and of not working for food that spoils, but for food that endures, well, not surprisingly, they want to know uh, where they can get their hands on it. Uh, so they ask in verse 28, what must we do to, to do the works God requires? Uh, what work do we need to do to, to get our hands on this bread? But listen to Jesus' surprising answer, verse 29. Uh, the work of God is this, says Jesus, to believe in the one he has sent. Well, well don't miss the shock of these words. Here is the most uh, precious and valuable thing that we could ever have or know, and to have it, to receive it. Uh, the work required is... It's just to believe in Jesus, to acknowledge him and to, to trust him. Uh, no list of, of rules or things we have to do. Uh, certainly no payment plan comes with this offer. No, says Jesus, the only requirement on our part is, is trust, is faith. Uh, faith that cries out to Jesus, that looks to him for what we cannot find anywhere else, uh, that simply holds out our empty hands uh, to receive that we might be filled. Well, it couldn't be clearer. It couldn't be simpler, could it? But did you notice the astonishing response of, of the crowd to Jesus' offer? Look down at verse 30. They reply, okay, so what sign will you give us so that we can believe you? What will you do to convince us that you can give us this bread? Uh, hello? He's just fed, fed, uh, fed 5,000 plus people uh, to bursting point with five rolls and a couple of fish. And they're demanding that Jesus give them a sign. Uh, Moses gave our ancestors bread or, or manna in the desert, they, they say. So what will you do? What, what supporting evidence will you supply so that we can consider your claim? I mean, seriously. Uh, they seem to be able to recall what happened uh, hundreds of years ago, but clearly they've forgotten what happened the day before. Well, I love how Jesus very patiently persists with his claim in verse 32. In effect, he says, OK, so you're excited about Moses and, and the bread he gave. Though actually, he didn't give it. 
But right now, the one who did, God the Father, uh, is giving, is offering the true bread from heaven that gives life uh, to the world. And what is this true bread that has come from heaven? Well, verse 35 tells us, Jesus declares, I am the bread of life. What, what you claim you want, says Jesus, is standing right there in front of you. And just as for those who are listening, so as we hear Jesus' words this morning, that offer is again being made. And can I say, if you've never responded to that offer of life, deep, uh, satisfying life, then don't miss out. Uh, don't ignore Jesus, but come to him. And indeed ask him to feed you, to fill you, uh, as you make him, uh, and knowing him, at uh, the centre of, of your life. And to come, to receive, doesn't require some, some blind leap of faith. Uh, no, Jesus provides the evidence. Uh, his miracle with the loaves and the fish is, is the evidence that shows that we can trust him. And of course, he'll do many more miracles to again guarantee uh, and back up his claim that his offer of life is indeed real. And if we need any further encouragement, just look down at the second half of verse 37. You see, for those who will come to him uh, for life gloriously, he will never drive them away. Indeed, in that wonderful word, uh, whoever, there is this glorious inclusiveness uh, to the invitation. It really is uh, for whoever. Well, that's a simple message, I think, of the passage. And if you are, are hearing that for the first time, or if you are someone who has who's never responded to Jesus' offer, then don't miss out. Uh, don't look anywhere else for, for satisfaction, for life that's real life and lasts. But there is some deep stuff here too. In this chapter, as elsewhere in John's Gospel, we are given a, a glimpse uh, behind the scenes, as it were, into the amazing relationship between God the Father and God the Son, and showing that how we too, who trust Jesus, have been, have been caught up and drawn into this amazing relationship. And as we see what Jesus reveals about that relationship and about us, I hope it will encourage us and indeed feed our faith. Well, as this crowd pressed for signs and even become more openly hostile to Jesus and his claims, how can you say that you come from heaven? We know your mum and dad. Uh, Jesus seems to anticipate or perhaps many of us are thinking. Okay, so the, the bread of life has arrived, uh, the one foreshadowed in the manna, uh, and it has revealed himself in this amazing miracle. Uh, he's come from heaven. And for the most part, it seems, those to whom he has come uh, seem disposed to, uh, to rejecting him and his, his offer. Uh, they taste the miraculous bread and are filled but turn away from Jesus himself and stubbornly refuse to believe. So why is that? Indeed, why today still do so many people ignore Jesus and his offer and only a few, it seems, receive it? Well, it is a question, isn't it, that has been hanging in the air right from the very first chapter of John's Gospel. Jesus came, says John, to his own, but his own did not receive him. And yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become a children of God. Well now, as we start to get a glimpse of what's going on behind the scenes into this relationship between uh, father and son, well, we get, I think, some clues to that, that answer. But they're not easy things to get our heads around as we try and hold on, I think, to a number of challenging truths that our, our small, finite minds are going to struggle uh, to hold together. But we do need to understand because, because they're true. And the first truth I wanted to see is this astonishing truth that uh, those who come uh, to Jesus are a gift from the Father uh, to the Son. Those who come to Jesus are a gift uh, from the Father uh, to the Son. We've already thought about Jesus offering us the gift of life. Uh, but here we discover that even before we ever receive that gift, Indeed, before history begins, God had promised uh, the Son uh, the gift of a people, of a kingdom of those who would be his, who would belong to him and uh, follow him. So look down at verse uh, 37. As Jesus is confronted by uh, growing uh, rejection, uh, he confidently declares that even 
uh, if these people refuse him and his offer, his father has given him people who will acknowledge him and will receive him. Well, even before we get to the, the harder things Jesus will say, that has, doesn't it, to be an incredible truth to get our heads around. And just in case we missed it, Jesus again repeats it in verse 38. Look, look down at verse 38. Uh, for I have come uh, down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. Do you see, all, all those who do come to the Son, who feed on him, are, are the Father's gift uh, to the Son. In other words, if you are a Christian uh, who believes in Jesus, who's come, who's come to Jesus, we are wonderfully caught up in this relationship between God the Father and God the Son as the gift of the Father to his beloved Son. And here is, is the first challenge. You see, I think we often think uh, of things the other way around. We think that uh, we are worthy and valuable because we have something to offer God. Uh, and that's why he chose us. But here in John 6, we discover that we are valuable, not ultimately because we offer something to God, but because God first chose to offer us as a gift to his son. And then Jesus stretches our minds still further by telling us that belief and faith in him uh, doesn't begin with us looking and searching for Jesus, but with the Father first drawing us to Jesus uh, to give us life. Do you see that there in, in verse uh, 44? Now, of course, I imagine some will find Jesus teaching hard. We want to assert that we chose God, that we made the running, and our choice ultimately lay in our power. But here, I think, Jesus turns our view of reality on its head, and it is deeply humbling. See, it knocks on the head, doesn't it, that popular idea that uh, as a race, we're on some great uh, quest and search for God. Actually, the truth is we're on the run from God, and it's only God's initiative and grace uh, that stops us in our tracks. So to put it crudely, if we get Jesus, if we get that he is the bread that we desperately need, it wasn't ultimately because uh, we were more clever. It wasn't because we were more thoughtful or perceptive and grasped what others missed. It comes down to the fact that God the Father wanted to give you to his Son and then took the initiative to draw you to him so that Jesus might save you and keep you and raise you and indeed make you his forever. Well, I imagine we'll have to come back to these truths again even this week and reflect on them some more. But do you see how this truth not only reveals our value, a value that rests on God rather than our performance, but it also provides real security too. You see, just as Jesus reveals that it was the Father's purpose and pleasure to gift his Son a people, so it is the Father's will and Jesus' absolute determination, verse 39, that Jesus lose none of those entrusted to him. And so if we are Christians, if we've come to Jesus as the bread of life, we find ourselves in that double grip, as it were, of the Father's choosing and the Son's keeping. So as Apostle Paul might say elsewhere, for the Christian, nothing in all the world can separate us from God's uh, passionate love for us in Christ Jesus. Nothing, not a deep failure, not depression, not death, can jeopardise uh, that deep security of being loved uh, by God. Well, these are big, aren't they, and challenging truths for, for small minds. And maybe as we grapple with them, we particularly wonder about, about those who haven't yet uh, come to Jesus. Uh, those who don't show signs of, of being drawn uh, by the Father. Perhaps those we care about, uh, those we love who uh, seem to show no interest in Jesus. Uh, does what Jesus uh, has been saying mean that uh, some people can respond to Jesus but others can't? Does it mean that if I, if I hold out on Jesus' offer, it was because the Father didn't uh, choose me as that gift or draw me? But as we try and make sense of this, just look down at verses 50 and 51. Uh, here is the bread that comes down from heaven, says Jesus, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will never, uh, will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Anyone, whoever. And Jesus could not be clearer, could he? Whoever wants this bread 
Whoever comes uh, to me for it, I will, I will never drive away. Anyone may eat and not die. See, if we come to Jesus, we will never be turned away. Jesus won't say, sorry, this isn't for you. You're not one of the chosen. No, this is the biggest, broadest, widest, most beautiful invitation ever offered. Come, says Jesus. If you know you're hungry, come and eat. If you hear the invitation, don't ignore it. Don't miss out. Well, as we draw to a close, there's one more thing we need to, to see. Did you notice, as Jesus speaks of being the, the bread of life, he takes things deeper still as he speaks of, of giving his flesh as bread, and then later giving his blood as drink. Well, maybe that just sounds uh, flat out weird. I mean, is Jesus saying we, we literally need to, to eat Jesus' body and, and literally drink his uh, physical blood? Well, these crowds certainly are confused. Uh, how can this man give us his flesh to eat, they argue. But Jesus doesn't back away, does he, from that statement. Look at verse 53. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, that's Jesus, and drink his blood, you have no life uh, in you. Well, I think it's clear Jesus is not speaking about uh, cannibalism, but it is shocking language, isn't it, as he reveals how he will provide us with that real lasting uh, satisfaction and give us eternal life. Well, as we hear these shocking words, I guess some will be thinking of the time where Jesus will again use similar language. Uh, we'll speak of his body being broken and his blood being poured out for others. When? Well, as he shares a meal of bread and wine uh, with his disciples uh, the night before uh, he goes to the cross and dies. And here's the point, it's only through Jesus' death, uh, his life being given up, his blood being shed, that we can be brought into this life-giving, life-satisfying relationship with the God that we're made for. Indeed, to come to Jesus, to believe in him, is more than simply so intellectually agreeing that Jesus is who he says he is. It means trusting his death uh, for me if I want to enjoy the life uh, he offers. Well, if it sounds weird or complicated, uh, let me try and explain it very simply. So uh, here is uh, my loaf uh, from Sainsbury's. Uh, I bought it yesterday and it's been sitting on my kitchen table over the last 24 hours. Now, uh, I could admire it. I could appreciate its uh, colour and its form. I guess I could talk to it. I could even sing the odd song to it if I felt inclined. I, I could even tell others just how glad I am that this loaf of bread uh, is in my life. If I did that, I think you probably would think I'm a bit weird. And I would be, wouldn't I? Because that is not how bread works. No, the reality is it's far more brutal than that. Uh, no, if, if I were to say anything uh, to this loaf, which I probably won't, but if I were, it would be along these lines. So look, bread, uh, it's either me or you. One of us is not going to survive today. Either you die or I die. Okay, that last sentence is stretching a bit, but do you, do you get the point? Uh, for this bread to sustain me, uh, to give me life, it has to be crushed. Uh, to keep me alive, it has to, to be broken and consumed. If you like that, the idea of sacrifice is written into the very way in which we eat. And when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, do you see, in order to, to have life, he's saying he has to, to die. His, his body has to be broken, uh, his blood poured out, that we might uh, receive that offer of life-satisfying bread. See, to live without God is death. Uh, to run life without, to re without reference to our Creator is, is the road to death. And even to enjoy God's gifts but to ignore God himself ultimately will kill us. But for us to know life, Jesus willingly gave up his. He was crushed and, and broken in my place. Uh, he experienced the death I deserved so that I might feed on him by faith and live. And we do have to eat, don't we? I can tear a piece of, of this bread off and break it, but I need to, to take it and eat. See, it's then and only then, as, I'm, as it were, I'm joined to that bread that, 
all its life-giving power and benefit is enjoyed. And so too, as we come to Jesus, as we trust and depend on his death, well, wonderful benefits he wants to give us become ours. Forgiveness, relationship with God, and satisfying life. Jesus said, I am the bread of, of life. Well, may we know the joy and reality of, of believing him, of trusting him. And may we continue to, to feed on him in our hearts this week. As we continue to meditate on these amazing truths in John 6, and as we ask Jesus to deepen that relationship with him as the only one who can give us life and life to the full. Let's pray. Father, these are mind-stretching truths that you have exposed us to this morning. Thank you that Jesus is the bread of life. The one, as the disciples will go on to say, who alone can provide that satisfying life our souls hunger for. Please may we, may we uh, each one of us, uh, respond to this wonderful invitation to, to come and to need to eat. Thank you that Jesus was willing to, to be broken, uh, to be crushed at the cross that we might share in his life. Uh, please may we continue to be nourished this week as we feed on him, as we seek to make him uh, the centre of our lives. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to end with some, a chance to sing, uh, to respond to Jesus and his offer, the great hymn that picks up some of these wonderful truths. Let's, let's where we are, sing and be encouraged uh, by those words and truths. <laughs> have a final prayer together. Uh, do join in the Sunday social if you can. Uh, if you're a visitor, why not check out the Emmanuel website? You'll find my details there. I'd love to hear from you if you want to get in touch. Uh, don't forget, next week is our special guest service. Is peace possible in turbulent times? Do please spread the word uh, this week if you could. Uh, let's pray together as we finish. Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. 
God, our Father, we pray that as we head into a new week, you would help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, that he would be to us the source of our peace and our satisfaction, that he would uh, give us rest for our souls. And Lord, as we experience his love and and mercy, uh, you would help us to be those who share his mercy and love with others in word and deed. Help us, Lord, even this week to to share with others the opportunity of our service next Sunday. Give us courage and boldness. Empower us by your spirit, we pray. And so we seek your blessing, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit to be with us this day and always. Amen.